embargo, followed by an embargo section for 10.30 p.m. tonight. No live tweeting during the broadcast section and use microphone provided. Michael. How you doing, Andrew? Right? I'm good, Mark. Um, I really like the interview you had this week, um, Australian Telly. I'm sorry if it's going to maybe repeat yourself a little bit, but just in terms of the four defeats, but sort of you relish in it and the challenge over the next few years, if you just sort of tell us more about that, because I just enjoyed the whole interview, basically. Um, yeah, I think I know which one you're referencing. Yeah, look, I, and I think I've been pretty consistent in saying that, that you know, we, we, yeah, we've got a, sort of a, a, a challenge at the moment, a short-term challenge, but I, I've... I always believe that they, they're, they're a constant in any kind of significant sort of rebuild you're doing, you know, that, that the challenges will always be there. It's how you approach them, how you tackle them, uh, because invariably there'll be another one down the road. And, you know, provided you, you get through them in the right way and with the right sort of attitude. And <clears throat> I think that's probably, you know, from my perspective, the most important time for me to, to kind of make sure that I'm clear-headed about you know what we're trying to do and what we're trying to achieve and, and more than anything be um, you know as visible as possible in that process because uh, you know, it's fair to say it's it's everyone's trying hard it's not through the want of trying so um, you know you, you've got to make sure that you know you stay calm clear-headed and um, and sort of uh, chart the way forward over the last few weeks do you feel maybe there's more to do and there might be more players than you realise that might just not be the ones you need going forward though and tougher decisions might need to be made in the summer? No, no, I mean, I, you know, again, I, I, I think I've tried to be as consistent as I possibly can in saying we've still got a long way to go and I, that hasn't changed from the moment I started till, till now and I think sometimes if, both in a positive and negative sense, if, if you go on sort of short term stuff, you, you're liable to jump at the wrong conclusions and wrong decisions. Uh, again, the planning for the summer has been well in, uh, in hand for quite a while. We know what we need to do. Nothing in that sort of space has changed. So, you know, for me, how players deal and staff deal with adversity is more important in terms of our growth than, than sort of a reflection of us needing to make more changes. There was a nice moment at the end of the Liverpool game, and we've been running that on Sky all week, where you, you're with the supporters and you're pounding your heart and then you're touching your head. What, what was the actual message there? Um, I, well, I, I don't really can't recall, to be honest. Uh, but um, look, I, I understand what the, what the fans are going through at the moment, and um, it's never nice when you go through these periods. But as I said, I, I think... You know, I don't think it's through the one of trying, and and I still firmly believe we're we're, we're on the right track. And this is just you know, some of the growing pains you need to go through. And you, as much as you'd like to, you know, um, avoid it, uh, it is part of the process of, of growth. And um, you know, for fans, for for us as a football club, is to understand that the road forward is is a challenging one. And but every time we get through these periods, I think we come out stronger and. Uh, Hopefully that'll happen this time. And finally, big weekend for the football club and, and Spurs women have got a huge FA Cup final. Just wanted to message Yeah, massive. Them. Yeah, no, massive. Uh, Rob and his players have been outstanding this year. I think the whole year, uh, again, um, you know, they've, they've made significant inroads in terms of their progress and, you know, the, the opportunity to play at Wembley, the opportunity to win a, tr torn, uh, a trophy is, uh, is brilliant for them. It's brilliant for our football club and, uh, yeah, couldn't wish them... Uh, uh, all the best, uh, um, you know. I think um, I think they'll acquit themselves well. You know, they've 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 shown some real good sort of um, resilience during the year, and uh, I think they'll hold them in good stead. Thank you. Thanks, mate. JD, um, JD Dyer from PLP, and uh, good afternoon. First of all, good um, afternoon, mate. As you're well aware, obviously failure for Burnley this weekend will lead them back to the championship. I, I just want to know from your perspective. Uh, how do you mentally get your team ready for a team that's going to be on the verge of desperation and probably come with an extra edge this weekend? How do you mentally get your team ready for something yeah, like that? Yeah, I think, again, you know, I'm pretty consistent in saying that I, I think you've got to sort of block that stuff out. And what's really important is that we kind of prepare ourselves for another big challenge, for sure. Um, but, you know, you get to this time of the year and most of the games are games of consequence. Everyone's playing for something. We're certainly still playing for something. Um, so... <coughs> You know, you don't want to follow the trap of, of kind of, you know, expecting something different uh, other than a really tough opponent. Um, as you said, um, you know, Burnley need a result uh, tomorrow. Um, 
and you know they've they've been really aggressive in their approach and trying to get there. If you look at the last sort of few weeks, um, they've picked up results and they've been a lot more aggressive in the way they've gone about it. So I think they feel like, well, you know, we're, we're going to go for it if we're going to have any chance to survive. So we're expecting a tough game, but I think from where we're at at the moment, I think much more important is how we kind of go into the game uh, with a focus on our football. On that note, um, obviously. For the standards you've set for yourself, 60 minutes that game last week would have been disappointing for your own standards. But there was a 30 minute period where there was probably some building blocks. So how can you take the positives that you saw maybe those last 30 minutes and kind of express them this weekend? Yeah, look, I, I thought there was positives in the six, you know, first 60 minutes as, as well. You know, I said after the game, it was obviously a disappointing defeat, but I thought we played more like ourselves. Uh, I thought there was a, more, a lot more sort of um, you know, a conviction in our football, a, a preparedness to to try and play against a really good opposition and and put pressure on them. Um, yeah, obviously, when you're four 0 down, doesn't look great, but as I said, that gives me something to to build on. And uh, yeah, last half hour was good from a output point of view, but I, I felt you know the thing that was missing before that was our final third um, action and. Um, yeah, you know, that kind of flipped on its head in the last half hour, where we got a lot more effective in the final third. So, as I said, disappointing, obviously, to, to not get the result in the way we, we, we lost the game. But um, there was enough there for me to to provide feedback for the boys. And then, obviously, we know we've still got a couple of weeks left in terms of the season, uh, but we've seen the infectious energy you've had all year. So, what have you kind of learned about yourself during this process in terms of your debut year in the Premier League, and what can you take take a spring ball to next year as well? Yeah, nothing. Um, yeah, nothing too spectacular. Um, you know, I am sort of who I am. I think uh, I haven't sort of I've resisted the the notion to try and change uh, the kind of person I am, and um, it's not easy in in the Premier League with all the attention and scrutiny and everything you say and do is kind of measured. Um, yeah, it's very easy to sort of yeah get distracted by that, but I think. Uh, you know, nothing I've uh, I've learned about myself this year that uh, I didn't already know um, is that I'm not a perfect human being, mate, and I'll keep moving on. Perfect. Thanks to uh, JD to Dan, please. Hi, Ange. Can, can I ask you about left back? Um, Ollie Skip came on in Liverpool and, and did quite well, I thought, for half an hour. Is he in contention to play that role? Yeah. Look, we've been we working with Skippy last uh, few weeks. Obviously, when we lost. Um, Destiny, then we lost Ben and, you know, we kind of left with Emerson, who's not really left back and, you know, we're kind of looking around at options and, um, you know, training, we've just been using him in that space. I thought he did he did do well when he came on. Look, I guess the way we played full-backs, um, you know, it, it, certainly with the, some of the positioning, he wouldn't be, um, you know, he, he wouldn't be too unfamiliar with some of the positions he'd need to take up as a midfielder. So um, so he's an option for us. I think we need another option because um, we've got three games this week and, um, you know, um, we've only got sort of Emerson as sort of a backup fullback at the club. So um, so it's an option for us. I wonder if I could just ask you d directly whether um, Skip is, is part of your plans going forward because there was a period a few games ago where he wasn't getting in in the squad at all and it feels like he's probably at a part of his career where he needs games so do you see him having a future here? Yeah I, I don't see any reason why not yeah he probably feels like you know he could have played more this year and um, again I think yeah you know, the way the sort of season's gone for us in terms of our games program we, you know, he's probably one of the ones that suffered because we haven't been able to sort of you know, get the, the the sort of game time rotations we needed um, through the year, but um, yeah, no, I'll, I'll see Skippy as part of our future. Thanks, Ali. Please, Hi, Ange. Uh, can I just check check on team news if there's any fresh injuries? Or no, nothing from last week. And uh, you mentioned there about the extra scrutiny you have, and, and obviously you've very much stuck to the, the person you've always been. But I think you've also mentioned in the past about maybe sometimes having confidence who you've spoken to when. Has there ever been kind of moments this season, or, or more moments where you've slightly wavered, or anything about? No, 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 no. <laughs> no, no. Sorry to disappoint. You know, if, if you want me to crumble, I can no. pretend, but I'm fine. I'm, I'm all good. Uh, I've, I've, I've loved and enjoyed every single second of it, mate. Uh, even these Friday half-hour little <laughs> powwows we have, mate. Um, it's, uh, it's all been brilliant. I've loved every minute of it, and. Uh, 
the confidence I have, I just mate, we just talk a bit of crap for a bit for for, for an hour or so because they're we're all going through similar stuff. But um, I'm uh, no, I'm in I'm in a, I'm, I'm in a really good space. Good to hear. Um, on, on a slightly grander powwow, you went to Buckingham Palace this week. I was just wondering how that came about and, and what was it like. Yeah, we got an invite uh, from the Australian government. Uh, me and the other Aussies uh, in the group here, so Millay, uh, Scott, I think Charlie uh, Grant from the women's team. Um, so, um, yeah, it was nice, uh, different experience. Um, j- just really inspiring because you, you kind of the people we met there, you know, people who work for charities, great causes, uh, military people, people who are real heroes in society. Just you know, just well, I mean obviously they know who I am and they'll come up and say hello but then just asking them about who they are in their life is just um, yeah you just see so many fantastic people who do so much in communities often without a lot of um, you know heralding from from the wider public or acknowledgement and I could see how happy they were to be there what how important because finally somebody you know there was some acknowledgement for them and um so uh, yeah and bizarrely enough the sun was shining mate so here in london so um yeah we had a no, uh, yeah, really nice afternoon was there any element of a pinch me moment for you obviously how far you've come your journey and then to be at buckingham palace with the king and all that sort of stuff yeah i mean i i didn't get within 10 feet of the king mate so <laughs> it's not like um we had a you know and if i had got closer I probably would ask them about the Parthenon marbles, and I would have probably got thrown out at some <laughs> point. Um, but no, it was it was nice for me and my wife. And like I said, not you know you, these are kind of experiences that that you're just fortunate because of the position I hold, not because necessarily because who I am. That you know you get these opportunities. And, and like I said, what we try and do, my wife and I, is just you know really immerse ourselves in that, and just like I said, just seeing the people in there and, and hearing their stories, it just, um, and, and more the joy they had of being there in, in that moment. And, you know, whether it's significant for me and my wife, just seeing how significant it is for them and you're in that space is just, yeah, it's special. So, um, yeah, it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was a good day. I'll finish with George, please. Hi, and um, I was just reading, that apparently the King is a fan of Burnley. That's his, Football team, so are you ready to? Uh, <laughs> That's probably why they kept him away from me, mate. Um, mm. Are you ready to disappoint him tomorrow and potentially? Oh, yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to disappoint him on that front, mate. No, <laughs> n- not a problem. And, um, on a serious note, I mean, the um, the last sort of run of games, I think three of the four defeats have been away. But how sort of keen are you to kind of get back to winning ways tomorrow and give the fans something for the, the backing they've shown, I guess, over this last? Yeah, week or I think that's important. As you said, you know, the three of the four defeats were were away from home, and we had the Arsenal game at home where, you know, we, well, again we lost, but you know, we, we, at least we gave something to our supporters. But I, I think it is important. Look, our supporters have been unbelievable this year for us. Um, you know, they've they've you know they've stuck through uh, stuck with us and, and and been a real source of encouragement for the players, um, home and away, and. Yeah, you know, they've sort of, you know, experiences have been, uh, you know, um, up and down, obviously, but they haven't wavered in their support. And, you know, it is, it's an opportunity with these last two home games on Saturday and Tuesday for us to, to hopefully send them off to the summer with, you know, not what we wanted to achieve this year, but with a hope that, um, you know, come next year, they're, they're, they're going to be ready to get behind us again. And just funny for me, Richardson scored at, at Liverpool, and, and that's the type of goal we scored a few times mm. this season. And I believe the type of goal your forwards generally do score. How much do you feel he's got to grips with with what you want from him, and, and is he someone that you see as a sort of a key part of, of what you're doing here moving forward into next season? Yeah, no. Look, Richie's been really good for us this year. I mean, you got to remember you know, I, when I took over, he scored one goal for the club, and. You know, for all intents and purposes, the jury was pretty much out on him in terms of any contributions. And, you know, he's got, he's in the double figures this year, I'm pretty sure, and he's missed a huge chunk of it. But every time he's played, he's looked effective like he did on uh, against Liverpool. Um, scored a good goal, set up the second one. A bit unlucky on a couple of other occasions, you know, the, the one Alisson saved and sort of Gomez is cleared off the line. So, and he, he, like I said, he's been really effective for us. And I, I think the way we play suits him to to a great degree and I think that's why he's got the goals but he's also worked hard himself so yeah it's just like I said it's unfortunate he's had a season of reflective of a lot of players that we've never had them sort of for a huge chunk of time consistently
Okay, we'll end the broadcast section there and move on to the embargoed section for 10.30 p.m. tonight. Tom? I think you were saying, if people are questioning you now, this is no different to what you had in Japan and in Scotland. I was just thinking back to Japan, that first season at Yokohama, it was tricky. Yeah. Um, and particularly because you were having to do it all through a translator. Yeah. I mean, what, what you will be going through for the last couple of weeks, I mean, does it not does it pale into insignificance compared to what you've had during the first um, No, because it's fair to say, like, the. You know, the, the, the scrutiny there wasn't as intense, even though, you know, we were kind of, you know, sort of on the, on the fringes of relegation, uh, even though I was pretty confident we'd be OK. Um, so it, it required a fair bit of a leap of faith that I was saying, well, you know, don't worry, we'll be, we'll be good next year. When, you know, it's not like we were sort of fourth or fifth or sixth. We were, you know, like I said, we were flirting with relegation at one point. Um, but I, I still saw signs in that time. I think we were the second highest scorers in the league. We conceded a lot of goals that year for sure. But I just thought, you know, if we make the right changes in the off season, I could see the players had bought into it 100%. The, the, the staff had bought into it. It was just a matter of making the right moves in the following year. And I thought, we're going to make some major ground. Now we ended up winning it the following year. But, <clears throat> you know, again, through that time, you, you always, whether it's outward scrutiny or you kind of question, OK, I'm not oblivious to, to seeing that, well, the results aren't great, but I've always kind of been good at looking below and saying, is there the stuff there that I need to see for us to continue to grow? And particularly at that time, I really felt strongly that, you know, we, the following year we would be a force, absolutely. I didn't know whether we'd win it, obviously, because to come from where we did to win it is pretty extraordinary, but I was confident that, you know, well, we'd make some major inroads. and. I feel the same way now. I think the underlying stuff that I look for is there. Um, do we have gaps? Absolutely. Um, is it surprising? No. Um, but that's hard to sort of outwardly explain to people who kind of rightly or wrongly are just looking at the results and saying, well, you know, with Yokohama we finished, I don't know, 15th or 16th. How are you going to win the league the following year? I would have sounded like a, even crazier than I do now. But that's I, I believed at that time that we were, we were in good shape and... Yeah, I believe at this time we're in good shape. It sounds like back then you were pretty confident in everything then. I mean, has that experience helped you now? Just solidify that confidence when it comes to being? Yeah, I mean, but, but again, the confidence only comes if I see things that, you know, are, are kind of reflective of what I want to see below the surface, you know, and uh, I do. I think there's a lot there, a lot of encouragement for us there in terms of where we're heading as a team. I do, I really believe that. Um, and but some of that won't come to the surface until we fill certain gaps. You know, it'll it'll stay below the surface, and we'll, we're going to have some, you know, fluctuations and, and some volatility in it, in our growth. Um, but as we continue to, to fill those gaps, or, or you know, I think when it does come together, it'll come together really quickly. Is what kind of I believe. <clears throat> You mentioned last week that some good players might have to go. I'm presuming that some of one of the players that you're going to build this team around. Jeez, that's a huge leap for you, mate. Eh? What, a, what a bold prediction that's, that I, that Sonny will be part of our future. Yeah, no, he's, he's going to be part of our future, mate. Yeah, that's all right. Thanks, mate. Matt? Yeah. Um, you've rotated your central midfielders around quite a lot the last few years. Yeah. Which is in quite stark contrast to early in the season when you were winning a lot of games where it's basically Sal and Suwa through a lot of the wins. Yeah. I just wondered why that was. Have you had doubts around the midfielders or have people start to perform better and therefore you want to see more of them? Uh, a little bit of both, I think. I mean, I, uh, I thought I thought Biss was outstanding against Liverpool last game. I think he's back to sort of his levels. Um, but again, you know, I thought before that he'd hit a bit of a flat spot. Um, you know, Similar to similar with matters, um, Pape, you know, when he came back from African Nations, wasn't nearly at the energy levels he was earlier in the year, and and part of it was me kind of, you know, I wanted to see Benton Core, you know, obviously Holberg got some opportunities, um, Geo to a lesser ex lesser extent. It's, uh, you know, I've said before, I need to find out as much as I can about where we're at as a squad. Um, 
but some of it was reflective of just performances and, and, and us sort of, you know, me looking for the right sort of combination in those areas, you know, for the challenges we had. But I said, I, I, I definitely Biss and Pape are, are now back, I think, to the levels they were earlier in the year for sure. Uh, and, um, you know, I think when they're, you know, when they're at their best, it, it, it does give us a little bit more of a, a fluency through that midfield. And, and just with you saying that, you know, you have taken a chance to look at a few of the midfielders, maybe some other players in other places. If there was a cup final tomorrow that you were in, would you know your best team? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Be the one that... You've I, seen enough of them. Be the one that I pick, mate, every time. So, uh, I, I, you know, I think... I don't think... I'd be very surprised if, oh yeah, maybe there are, but I've never gone in with the notion of who my best team is because I, I, I just think you're talking about a cup final. It's usually won by you know a squad of players, not just a starting eleven. So if we're in a cup final, I'd, I'd, I'd know who my team. I think I'd win, but you know, I, I look, I, I don't. As I keep saying, I think we've got a long way to go. So you know, we're nowhere near the levels we need to be to, to really compete at the levels I want us to compete. So invariably that means that there's going to be a little bit of um, sort of exploration for me as to, you know, who fits, who doesn't. And, and just finally for me, yourselves and actually Villa are also a good example, peaked, probably peaked earlier in the season and now sort of grinding mm -hmm. to the end. Is there a skill to preparing the team, the squad, Peaking at the right time, you know, we see City mm. every year. Yeah. The end are unbelievable. Mm. Is there a skill and, and, and things you can do to prepare yeah. to peak at the right time? Yeah, it helps if you've got a strong squad like City have. That that kind of helps you. Um, but yeah, it is. It, um, I don't know if it's a skill, but I think there's there's a learning in there if you can, and and I think that comes through experience of players understanding the rigors of of competition at this level um, and the demands of it and, and getting used to that. So, you know, I, I think for us, you know, we've had a lot of players this year who kind of, this is their first real experience of Premier League football at this level, you know, Vicario, Van der Ven, Destiny, even Pape didn't play much last year. Um, some of them, you know, like Brennan had a bigger club. So all these kind of things, I think, you know, for them, it's, it's going to be a great sort of learning ex experience and, and building of resilience for, for years going ahead that, you know, you can't have a real drop off at any stage. You need to maintain that. Um, so some of it I just think is, you know, as you see players mature, I think squads mature as well. You know, if you can keep a, a core of players together season after season and kind of build on success, then I think they learn as a group to, to, to maintain levels through a year. Still seems personal. Do you, do you care if you're in the top four or not? And have you given up? <coughs> oh, mate, you really think I'd like that's that's a harsh term, give up. What does that mean? That I come in here at 12 o'clock, have a latte, and then go home and just let the guys train? I mean, I don't give up in anything, mate. I'm, I'm here fighting tooth and nail every single day for everything I can get for this football club because that's my responsibility. I would not give up on any cause, even the, the the most lost of causes, because then I'd be abstaining from my responsibility. So I want us to finish the season strong. I want us to try and win three games of football and see where that takes us. Um, I'd never said that I didn't care about finishing top, top four. What I said was that finishing top four does not mean we're going to be um, the team I want us to be next year. That's not what's going to define us. So I don't give up. and. I'd be surprised if anyone in my position um, at this level would would go in with anything other than a hundred percent commitment to fight for everything. Because if you don't, invariably you fail. It's just that, you, that, that there is this theory, and again we've asked before that, that in terms of what you develop, then Champions League might be a bigger league. Oh, yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the yeah. yeah. No, I mean I, I I get that, but. It doesn't mean you, you, you don't want to finish as you know as high as possible and, and get into the best possible competition. But but that I guess was my point was that finishing fourth and getting to the Champions League 
does not make you a Champions League club, in my opinion. It just gives you an opportunity to be in there. To me, to be a, a Champions League club, what I mean by that is at that level requires more than just finishing fourth in, in one year, as far as I'm concerned, it means. And do I believe right now we're a Champions League football club? No, we're not. That's that's my honest belief. I think we need, as I keep saying, we've still got work to do. But that doesn't mean I didn't want us to make Champions League with a, you know, that kind of that's self-defeating in terms of what I'm trying to create. But had we made Champions League or ha should we make Champions League this year and finish fourth, it isn't going to change my view about where we're at and what we need to do in the summer. Um, and, you know, that's still sort of real clear in my head. Can, can I also ask, just, when you talk about scrutiny, the Premier League being a little bit different, is, is there a, a good example of that? This room, mate, you know, uh, what... Uh, no, in no, no, but but in terms of the interest, there is in it. So I mean, in in you know, in Japan or in in Scotland, the press conferences were a lot smaller. So I think you guys are reflective of the interest in the game. Like there's so much more um, sort of platforms now. I mean, now more than ever, I guess, because it, they're not just the official platforms. It's the unofficial platforms that are just as um, you know, vocal, where, like I said, everything, and everyone watches the Premier League, doesn't matter where you are, I, I'd hazard to guess that, you know, you guys are always, aren't always following the, Jap, the J League, but in Japan they're following the Premier League, you know, everyone watches Celtic Rangers, maybe they don't always watch the whole of the Scottish Premiership, but everyone in Scotland follows stuff down here, so that's all I mean, I mean, it's just, it's just, it's the most visible competition, sporting competition in the world, I believe, so, uh, so when I, when I talk about scrutiny, I just mean that there's, there are physically a lot more eyes on it, therefore there's a lot more opinion on it, um, therefore there's a lot more scrutiny around that as, as a consequence. I'll finish with John, please. Do you think the criticism that's come your way in the last four games has been harsh then? No, I think it's, it is what it is. I, I, I don't, I've never measured kind of, I, you know, because as I've said all along, it, it, it's it's it doesn't change my approach. I feel that you know whether it's supporters, whether it's people who are following the game, whether it's people who analyse the game, have a right to have a say. And if if they feel that I'm somehow falling short or I'm, I'm not sort of performing my duties in the right way or I've made mistakes, then I think they're allowed to say it. But I'm also allowed to not pay any attention to it. And not because I don't respect it, but I just don't think it's relevant to me. And the reason I keep saying that is because, and I, I always kind of temper my kind of, if I do hear of anything that comes my way that you know is less than complimentary, I always kind of sit back and go, at the same time, whoever's making that opinion or making that assumption doesn't have all the information I have. So I'm always dealing with all the information. So what may seem illogical from the outside to me, you know, is very logical, but you're not to know that. But if people want to criticise, if people want to question, I think that's, that's their right. It doesn't affect me. Um, and it certainly doesn't sort of change what I'm, sort of my approach and what I'm trying to achieve. And at the same time, plenty of people are saying good things about me when things are going well. So, you know, I can't turn around and say, well, no, don't criticise me, but then accept, you know, you've got to deal with both. And even when they were saying good things about me, I wasn't paying attention there either. So I kind of... Look, I, I mean, you know, we, we mentioned Japan, but it was four years of bliss for me. I, I didn't understand the language, couldn't read the papers, didn't understand TV. I, I just assumed everyone loved me, mate. So <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was a beautiful existence. Yeah, but that's all right. But, but that's, oh, I love that, mate. I, and, and you've got to understand where I've come from. I crave this. Like, I was in Australia, and irrespective of what I achieved there, it was never going to barely raise a ripple in, in general society because of, you know, and I, all, I, all I wanted was attention. Not, not I'm, I should <laughs> reframe that. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> Put it this way, the right sort of attention where everything I did was scrutinised. So, and if I happened to be successful, well, 
that means actually I've made an impact, you know, that, you know, that's, who, who doesn't want that? Or if I'm not going well, okay, people care about that as well. So oh, I love that, but I can see how, you know, if you've been in it for a very long time, it can become fairly, you know, draining and wearing, particularly for managers today. I, I can see that, you know, where you're kind of, irrespective of what you may have, may or may not have done, you're constantly, you know, that scrutiny is always there, the, the, the pressure's never off, there's always somebody under the spotlight, and after a while you might go, I don't know, maybe Jürgen falls into that baby game, I've, I've had enough now, I need a, I, I can understand that, but that hasn't been my sort of existence up till now, so I love it, so, but, you know, that to me. Um, yeah, I, I, look, I, look, I, no, I, I don't want to say, I'll tell you why I don't want to say, all right, because, because, you know, when I'm all said and done and I'm going to write a book because I've got some cracking stories, um, but it's just how sort of, without, without using the, the sort of the wrong word, how sort of repetitive some of the things have become in my career of me having sort of ask, answer the same sorts of, of questions along the way and that it, it, that cycle doesn't seem to change at no point. And, um, and it kind of, it still surprises me that, that you know, that that angle is still very, very, the, the, very much the prevalent one, even though, you know, like I said, it's kind of been, you know, rinse, recycle, repeat for me a lot, a lot of my career, and, and it's been the same here this year, where a lot of the questions, I think, um, I think it was Charlie that might have asked me, he said that, you know, something along the lines, do you allow your players to shoot or something, and I had that question when I was at Brisbane Raw because we kept passing it with Tiki Taka and all that. And now, do you let your players shoot the ball? And I remember when he said it to me, I think I smiled because I've like, just gone back 24 years, you know. Um, which is fair enough, I get it, because for, for most people it's new. But um, but for me, it's just, yeah, it's uh, it's been an interesting kind of uh, journey, mate. Cool. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Cheers, guys. Cheers.